Hello everyone, my name is AB and this is Blender52. Today we will be discussing the post-processing of your renders, why you should be doing it and how to go about it, as well as a light background into some of the different features in your photo editing software. Warning that this is a long video, but please stick with it, the content is truly worth it. So why should I post-process my renders? They already look great, right? While it is possible to get perfect results straight out of your 3D application with an expert lighting setup, chances are there's probably still room for improvement. If not in brightness, contrast, and levels, then in saturation, vibrance, temperature, or other effects such as blur, glare, or vignetting. First off, let's talk about editing software. Your first choice should you have the means to get it, is Photoshop, as honestly, nothing else comes close in terms of flexibility, power, and speed. There are free options out there, such as GIMP, which is great as a free alternative, but sadly, lags behind Photoshop, especially when doing heavy work. You can also try online options, such as Photor, but its functionality is limited, and many options are closed behind a paywall anyway. So let's get to it. I will be using Photoshop for this tutorial, but if you are in a different software, don't worry as the key concepts and main tools will be the same. Something else that I want to express is that while I can show you how these tools work and give you an understanding as they function, it will still take practice and finesse to use them effectively. So in Photoshop, what I want you to do is make sure you can see the histogram panel. So come up here to the top right hand corner and we're going to click on histogram and this will normally be set to colors. I want you to change it to luminosity. The histogram panel displays the tonal range of your image. It shows how the pixels are distributed by graphing the number of pixels at each of the 256 brightness levels in the image with white being on the right and black being on the left. What this histogram will allow us to do is see a nice real-time consequence for each action that we're going to be taking in this tutorial. The first thing we can do in Photoshop, and these are the only examples I'll be going over which aren't present in other software, are the quick and easy auto options. These are the three auto-mapped options within Photoshop, which depending on the raw state of your image can sometimes give great results on their own, other time the results will be a little negligible. So if we come up here to image, we've got auto tone, auto contrast, and auto color. Each of these will give a slightly different result. You might not be able to see that anything even happened there, but the image got a little bit cooler. And if you're watching your histogram, you'll see that they did change. So if I go back to the original state, you can see the slight change in the histogram. So it's nothing dramatic. And likewise, if we do auto tone, again, you'll see a slight change in our histogram. It smooths out a little bit, which is what we want. Ideally, we want more range here in the white. And you can see that it, it smooths out a little bit. So sometimes you'll get good results depending. It all comes down to what your original image looks like. If it's very flat, you're gonna get more dramatic results. And if your image already has a fairly decent dynamic range, you'll get less dramatic results. Next up, we will look at brightness and contrast. Adjusting the brightness either positively or negatively will shift all the pixels in your image in one direction, either towards white or towards black. So if we come into image, adjustments, brightness, contrast, you'll see that we get these sliders. And if we drag the slider to the right, you can see that everything gets brighter. And if we drag it to the left, everything gets darker. So all your pixels are being affected uniformly. So this is a uniform change across all your pixels. Everything either gets darker or lighter. I'm sure you can tell that while this can be, it's effective, it can also be a little bit clumsy and it lacks control in that you can't make certain elements brighter and certain elements darker. It's either all or nothing. Looking at the contrast slider, this is used in conjunction with the brightness slider and either increases or decreases the difference between the brightness, which is your peak white level, 
and the darkest, which is your black level, portions of the image. Your original image will dictate the amount of change required, but often when using brightness and contrast, I would suggest that less is often more. While a bright, high contrast image will look visually appealing, it starts to err uh, away from the realism that you're probably after, as real life seldom depicts light in this way. Let's look at levels, as this method offers far more control and power over your image compared to the brightness and contrast slider. Instead of one slider, level offers three. One which controls your dark pixels, one which controls your mid-range, and one for your light pixels. Being able to adjust each individually gives you far more control. So if we come up to image, adjustments, and levels, you'll see this dialog box comes open. And what's really handy is that you can see we already have a histogram loaded in. So I just want to reload our original state as that's going to illustrate the purpose a lot better. So you can see that this image is lacking a fair amount in the white data range. You can see here from 250 up, there's zero white data. So we're just going to slide that over a little bit and you'll see that the image starts to get a bit brighter. And if I let it go, you'll see that our histogram up here has changed. And you can see that we now have a ton of white data where we would normally want it to be. I'd say that this is a little bit overkill though. We can drag it back over a little bit. And then we can see our histogram updates and it's, it's a lot less dramatic and a lot more gentle in the curve. That's what you want is a nice curve up to your middles. So likewise, we can do the same thing on the other side with the black, black slider. You can see that we already have decent black data here, but we're just going to drag it over a little bit just to increase our contrast a bit. And if you notice that the contrast is getting a bit too dark, then you can just adjust your gray slider towards the black and that will lower your contrast a little bit. And you can now start to see, you can see where our histogram used to be with the spark kind of more to the left. Whereas now your spark is starting to go more towards the middle and it's got a much more gentle slope for your white and a nice gentle increase for your black. You'll notice that as we move the black slider, the middle slider moves with it. And that's because generally speaking, you want this middle slider to stay in the middle. So as we move it, you see it moves. But in this case, we want to drag it over just a little bit to the left just to decrease our contrast a little bit. So if we open up the history panel up here, which you can see it says history, and we click that, we can click between our original state and our new adjusted state, and you can see already the difference that that has created in our render. It's already looking much better. Next up, let's take a look at vibrance and saturation. So we're going to come to image, adjustments, vibrance. And we now have a slider for vibrance and for saturation. The main difference between the saturation and vibrant sliders is that the vibrant slider doesn't treat all pixels equally. Vibrants only adjust the least saturated colors in the image. Colors and pixels that are already saturated are adjusted less, which means that it is less likely to blow out any colors. So if we dial it all the way up, you can see that our blues start getting very saturated while our reds, such as the fire hydrant over here, stays almost exactly the same. It gets a little bit more, but it's not as dramatic as the blues. We then also have saturation in a different tab, where it's granted even more power. So use it sparingly. So we're going to go to image, adjustments, hue, saturation. So let's drag that over there. Saturation can be a great way to really make your colors pop, but similarly to brightness and contrast, too much will make your image look less real. So if we dial this up, you can see that it has a much more dramatic effect compared to the saturation in the vibrance and saturation tab. This thing just kind of hammers everything with vibrance. 
or with saturation rather, sorry. So if we drag this a little bit, we can get a nice, a nice increase to our image. We then also have this lightness slider, which is similar in a way to brightness and contrast. Whereas if we move it all the way to the right, it makes our image completely white. And if we move it all the way to the left, it makes our image completely dark. So it's like a super overpowered version of the brightness slider uh, where it moves all of your pixels to one end of the scale. You can see in our histogram, literally every single pixel has moved to the far right 256 level column. So I wouldn't really recommend that. This I'd rather recommend using brightness or contrast or rather levels to adjust. But if you see, if we lift it just a little, it can have a, a decent effect over here specifically where we we just kind of knocking out the saturation of that shadow. Okay, now we're going to have a look at some of Photoshop's most powerful editing options, the camera raw filters. In order to fully take advantage of these features, you would want to be exporting as an EXR out of Blender instead of a PNG, which I presume most of you are doing as that's the default. As while a PNG is eight or 16 bits, EXR takes full advantage of a full 32 bit and gives you more color data to work with. Having said that, this is still a very powerful tool in your post-processing adventure, regardless of your file format. So in order to access these, you're gonna to go to filter and you're gonna click on camera raw filter. Now, depending on the power of your computer, this may take a second or two. And then we're just gonna come here under basic and open up basic. And you're gonna see we get this bevy of options, many of which will look similar to those we've already discussed. You can see that we've got vibrance and saturation. We've also got contrast. And here we've got things like highlights, shadows, whites and blacks, which allows you, this is very similar to levels in a way in that it allows you to edit just your highlights or just your shadows. You can make just your shadows darker or make your shadows a little bit lighter if you feel like they've gotten a bit dark. And similarly, you can adjust your whites individually of your blacks. So first up, let's talk about temperature control which is this top slider. So this is basically an adjustment of the Kelvin rating. So you can go very warm or very cool. So depending on your scene, you may want to convey a certain atmosphere. This can be very powerful for storytelling. Cool colors express things like not concrete cities, bad emotions, stuff like that, while warm colors will be used to express happiness, uh, landscapes, and vibrance. You can also use both as a tool to emphasize elements, a cool version to push background elements back, and a warm version to bring foreground elements closer. These can be put over one another and edited to emphasize distance and space. I recently used this technique in my sweatshop render. Okay, so I've opened up the sweatshop render. And you can see this is my base level, which I've made very cool. You can see everything has kind of got a slightly muted blue over it. And then I've got another layer, which I'm just gonna turn off the layer mask before enabling it. So we turn that on and you can see this is a very warm version of the render. So I've got that on top of the cold version. And then if we re-enable this layer mask, you can see that now, if I swap through them, the background is remaining cool while I've allowed the warm version of the bark and some of this light. You can see here by my little alpha mask, it might be a bit small in the video, but in the mask, everything that's white is showing at 100%. And as it gets darker, that's taking away from the image. It's masking it off. So everything here is at 100% of the warm image. And as it goes to the corner, it goes to the blue cold image. This pushes your background images back and it brings your foreground images closer. So let's just take a look at vibrance and saturation here for a quick second. 
you'll notice that they are even more overpowered if you come into this menu. And that's simply because this camera raw is meant to be used for raw images that you would get out of a camera, which are traditionally specifically created to be very flat. So these tools are more powerful in order to extract that color data out of the flat images supplied by Camera Raw. So I wouldn't recommend using them in this menu, rather use them in the previous menu as shown. Next up is the Effects tab. So let's just close Basic for ease of use. We're gonna come down here to Effects. We open that one up and you can see we've got grain and we've got vignetting. So let's just talk about vignetting first. If you use it, use it sparingly. Also, don't put it on every single render. It's something that's there to enhance a stylized aspect of your render. It's not something that's there to hide poor renders. So on a render like this, I would never use it as it's not something that you, you're really going to get in an outdoor shot like this. Whereas in my recent steampunk render, which let me pull that up quickly. So in this render, you can see that I've added a vignette, which I very seldom do. But in this case, it actually increases the mood and it helps bring out those steam shadows and the steam effect even more. It looks like the steam is, is alive and vibrant. So grain. But AB, I've worked very hard in Blender to get rid of noise. Why would I want to add it back in? Well, in general, 3D applications, you get noise when your light source hasn't had enough samples to fully ray trace its approximation. As a result, you get noise in the light or brightest areas only. Adding grain will give you uniform noise over the entire image. This can often help cell realism as almost all cameras have at least some form of noise in them. So if we dial this up a bit, it would almost look like maybe a little bit heavy. Dial it up just a little bit so that it looks like the kind of noise that you would get in an actual camera. Okay, so here is our final post-processed image. And if we go into the history tab again and we click on the original, you can see that was the original. It's a little bit flat, it's a little bit drab, and we've just made some subtle changes. And if we click on that one, you can see where we end up. We've got some better whites, better blacks, a better saturation, and I added a little bit of warmth as that was the atmosphere I wanted. I wanted it to feel like a hot, deserty kind of condition. So again, you can see that was the original, and then that is the final post-processed image. Post-processing can take an ordinary render and make it look amazing, and everyone should be using at least some form of post-color correction. I hope this video has been able to give you a better understanding of some of the hows and whys you should be editing your renders. If you have enjoyed the video, please remember to subscribe for more. You letting me know you like it motivates me to make more videos. I would also like to give a shout out to our Patreon supporters without whom this video would not be possible, Chris Good, Lee Boynton, Nigel Hillier, and David Deckard. If you would like to become a supporter of the channel, please head on over to patreon.com forward slash blender52. Thanks for watching. Cheers.